to share my slide. All right, can you see this? Sorry, is, can you hear me? Yes, all good. We can see okay. it, we can hear you, you're good. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you so much. My internet is slightly unstable just at this moment. I really hope it will be fine for us. So today I'll speak about Stoic Compassion, cultivating inexhaustible inner resources. And uh, I, as Brittany mentioned, um, I have been writing a blog, The Stoic Mom, since 2016. I also now uh, write it as a Substack so that you can get it directly in your email inbox. So please, uh, please feel free to visit thestoicmom.substack.com to go ahead and sign up for that if you'd like to hear more from me. I also tweet periodically at The Stoic Woman. So thanks so much for joining today. Okay, I'm just trying to advance my slides. Uh -oh. ah, there we go. Okay. So I wanted to start by just saying stoic compassion is not an oxymoron. This is something Brit Brittany was mentioning up. Um, it's clear that some people still think of stoicism as having a stiff upper lip and not actually being responsive to others and being unemotional and almost robot-like. But we know in the stoic community that that's not true and that in fact, um, you can uh, cultivate compassion as a Stoic. And in fact, it is something that was, I think, highly prized among some of the ancient Stoics who shared it and wrote about it, um, you know, thousands of years ago. And I think that we should really try our best to combine these two forces because both of them are these inexhaustible inner resources, as I mentioned. Both of them uh, can come from within you. And if you cultivate them together, it's an extremely powerful combination. I first came to both of these things back in around 2015 or so. Um, I was starting to feel very anxious and very concerned. I had two young children and I wanted really to raise them right um, and form a, you know, a family with my husband where we could set good values and ensure that our kids could, uh, you know, become eventually independent adults who could think from the, themselves and do well in this world. And I also experienced a lot of um, turmoil when I saw all the things that were happening around me, uh, division and lots of um, conflicts in our country and things were just seemingly uh, very filled with people hating each other and, and, and not really trying to feel compassion for other people. So I did decide to uh, do this workshop at Stanford University, which is in the medical school, as well as has been influenced heavily by Tibetan Buddhism, which teaches you over a series of weeks to try to cultivate compassion within yourself. Later, I also participated in a self-compassion workshop with Kristen Neff, who is a very well-known uh, researcher and advocate for self-compassion. So I'll be speaking about both of those things. First, compassion. What is compassion? It is from Latin with suffering. So we tend to not think of passion in that way these days in our modern interpretation of what passion means. But in the uh, ancient times, there was this concept of uh, passion being suffering with suffering is we want to acknowledge that other people face pain, loss, and adversity. That is already core, I think, to stoicism. So we already begin with that. If you're already in the stoic community and you have um, learned those messages through stoicism, this is a great start to also cultivate compassion because you're aware of it. Uh, you're not kind of sweeping that under the rug. You know that there's adversity in this world. Uh, you may even do the premeditation of adversity and think about it and think about how it affects you and how it affects others, your loved ones. So it's the desire to help others suffering. And the core of compassion is really being there for others and wishing them happiness and peace. Um, it's about paying attention to other people's challenges and their needs so interestingly, in the compassion cultivation work that I did, meditation is really one of the key ways to reach this feeling of compassion for others. Um, and there have been studies that have actually shown the efficacy of, of this. Um, so a study was done saying, were people in a waiting room 
willing to give up their seat for a person using crutches who walks in and there's no seats for this person. Really interestingly, those who practice meditation scored much higher. It was about 50% of the people who gave up the seat versus 16% who gave up their seat if they weren't. So, I mean, it was a small study, but I found that quite interesting. And one of the things that they said, and I think they repeated it in another way, and it was a fairly similar result. Um, Meditation-based training reduces activation of the brain networks associated with simulating the feelings of people in distress in favor of networks associated with feelings of social affiliation. So I find this really interesting and I'll speak later in my talk a little bit more about the differences that I've seen between compassion and empathy. But I think that is really what we're talking about here is it's it's great to, the, the concept of empathy is great that you feel someone else's pain, but there's a lot of reasons why that can actually lead to barriers in you relating to the other person. In fact, what gets you in a position to relate and care more is compassion because it's the sense of social affiliation and pro-social behavior, which also connects it to stoicism because it's common humanity. It's it's we seeing that everyone else faces troubles and so do we, and we are all humans. We are in the human family. Common humanity should lead us to be be able to help each other and care for each other. Um, and it allows us to be with another person's pain, which I think is actually pretty hard, especially in American society, where we feel like we always need to fix other people, uh, that somehow pain is abnormal or not even pain just itself, like physical pain. I'm talking about more like suffering or people who are in need or in distress. Um, we always feel that, oh, well, we could just fix that somehow um, with a medication or with you know something new that they can try. But a lot of times there are very deep issues that can't just be fixed. And in fact, it's really not our job as the loved one of a person who is a suffering to fix them. So if we if we view it more as we are showing our kindness and being with the other person while they're suffering, without absorbing it into our own being, we are preserving our resilience, but we're also there for that person, then it will not run out or kind of be exhausted. So these are the, this is why it's an inner re resource that we can take care of and cultivate while we really try to build those relationships using this compassion lens. I would say we need this now more than ever. Uh, we're really a deeply divided country in the U.S. I know people are also um, calling in from other places around the world, but I think we see this in a lot of places, that there are many divisions and many conflicts among people right now um, where people view someone else as the other. Um, and many people are suffering, but if you view the other person suffering as, oh, well, that's someone suffering who is unworthy of compassion or care for me, that's almost someone who's less than human, that's really dangerous and I think could be potentially violent. And if we've seen horrible violence in history result from that kind of thinking, people in their own bubbles or in their own in-group and not being able to feel anything for others. So we should be cultivating compassion for other struggles, even if we disagree with what they choose or what they believe in. This is really doubling down on our common humanity. And I would love, love to see more of this in our society. I found this really interesting and wanted to share. Um, I think of this as experiments in compassionate perspectives. So um, could we bring together people who disagree or people who don't, you know, are from varying different groups to build compassion with each other? Um, a Stanford experiment in 2019 showed that people's views could actually somewhat shift and soften a little bit when they talk to each other about some really um, hot button issues, including immigration, when they actually had speakers come in who were immigrants who talked about how it affected them. Um, some people's views in this study had actually somewhat softened softened, which I thought was quite interesting. And so it's about maybe understanding the other person's perspective. Um, I noted here some groups that are doing this, which I also find interesting. And there, there may be up to 200 of these groups in the US, which, and this is more about um, civil society and maybe political issues. Uh, but I think it's quite an interesting idea. And could more compassion really change the world instead of people subdividing into bubbles and uh, seeing other people as so distant others, maybe we can start to build a little bit more compassion and care for others. And of course, this gets back to the circles of concern that we know from stoicism as well, that we do radiate out these different circles in our common humanity. Just one moment. Okay, so I would like to talk next about stoic compassion. Um, so I've already shared a bit about compassion itself. 
and about stoic compassion, um, I believe it's the missing piece that can connect your stoic practice to other humans. We do know it's embedded in stoicism to care for other humans, but I think maybe sometimes it's not super obvious on the surface of things. And I think this, if you keep this in mind, you will be able to feel an even more powerful um, practice of stoicism because you'll, you'll bring in this way to connect through common humanity. So you can unite your stoic ruling center with this compassionate ability to support and care for other people and yourself through adversity. Since we already acknowledge adversity happens, we know we have common humanity. This is the way to connect those two things in my mind. Uh, let's talk about what stoicism and compassion have in common. As I said at the beginning, both are inexhaustible inner resources. What do I mean by that? I mean that you, you grow them within, you grow them in your mindset, in your personal practices and in, in kind of what's within you. I view it as they burn like a flame. And this is something that was mentioned, I think in the Tibetan Buddhism portion of the uh, compassion cultivation. It's kind of this concept that it it's it's can be always there burning inside you like an eternal flame. And that's what radiates out to others. You, as long as you can keep that lit within, you can be there for others. And it's, to me, it's sort of similar to if we really have built the virtues inside us as well and the, the stoic virtues, those, you know, we don't have to go out and tell everybody, go be virtuous. We kind of show it through our behavior and through how we treat others. And I view compassion the same way. We show it through how we treat others. And then it kind of, we hope can almost reflect back on us where that fire is radiates out. And then maybe it radiates back to us if others see it and start behaving that way around us. Um, and it really can transform how you talk to yourself, how you mentor yourself. If you think about things in terms of this lens of care and support and, and kindness instead of, uh, you know, bitterness, judgment, recrimination, and all these things. So we can show up differently for others and ourselves if we think uh, in both the terms of stoicism and compassion. So here's some concepts I think we can keep in mind to really uh, do both, uh, be Stoics and be compassionate. Um, initially, I, I did want to mention too, one thing in common with both of these philosophies and these approaches is that we know some things are in our power and other things are not in our power to change. So no, we cannot prevent that loved one who's very sick from dying. We just can't change that. Um, and that is both like at the core of stoicism and compassion, I think, knowing that those things happen, bad things do happen and uh, things that we find to be adversity and we find to be difficult to deal with. It's normal actually. And we have the inner strength to tolerate it and to tolerate the pain or suffering of other people using this kind of mindset. Um, so we share common humanity throughout the circles of concern and practicing mindful awareness and some meditations, which I will also share at the end of my talk, are really a good way to access these ways of thinking um, as you try to be as compassionate as you can as a Stoic. Um, and I kind of like the concept of letting the inner daemon be your guide, kind of let, letting that, um, that voice inside of you show you the path to both of these powerful, powerful approaches. But the elephant in the room is self-compassion. I don't want to move forward any further without addressing this topic because it's very hard to have really solid compassion for other people uh, if you don't feel a sense of support and care for yourself. I mean, this is the whole, the old adage of put on your own air mask first before you help other people, which is actually quite true because if you're very, very caring to others, but you have no real care for yourself, you're really risking burnout and anxiety and other mental health issues, I think. Um, and this, this does happen to people and it's really very common, I think, in our Western society and perhaps everywhere these days. Um, so, so what is self-compassion and why does it matter? It's really treating yourself as you would treat a friend. 
So um, many times I'll hear myself say something my, to myself and I said, I would never say that to a friend. You know, it's, it's stopping to question that harsh inner voice that many of us have that's very self-critical or very uh, self-judgmental. So it's about being warm and caring and supportive and forgiving to yourself. Um, I'm sure we can all think of examples of these things that happen constantly. Even just this morning, I, I had one example where we uh, we had a family photo of my family and I had been debating whether I wear this jacket and I said, oh, it's kind of shiny. Well, I wore it and then I saw the photo and I really thought it looked not too good. And I said, oh, why did I wear such a shiny jacket? And so that's just a very, very, very tiny example of just something this morning where I said, okay, I have to try to treat myself as a friend. I didn't, I didn't really know. <laughs> it's very minor anyway. Um, but those are things that, you know, you can have this happen with much, much more major things in life and feel very uh, upset and angry at yourself. And really, um, we need to try to do sort of the opposite, bring, bring this energy of kindness and caring and support to ourselves when things are hard and when we fail at something. Uh, so part of it's actually just being aware of those, those thoughts and those feelings that go through your mind, uh, because maybe it's so deeply ingrained, even from childhood that we might not even be aware that it's, it's a way of thinking that we could change. Um, we ha have to really recognize our own common humanity. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone wears something that, you know, they, they aren't happy with later, <laughs> very minor, but like everyone, you know, could choose to uh, do something that is, doesn't really uh, end up turning out that well. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, it's just a common mistake. I mean, uh, it's, it happens to everybody. So the, the kind of the dirty secret is that many people don't have very much. They have very little self-compassion. You can take a test to find out your level of self-compassion online at uh, Dr. Kristen Neff's website, the self-compassion test. I found it very interesting. It gives you a lot of questions that will help you even stop to think about, oh, Oh, I see. I never realized that that's, that's a sign of me being not very compassionate towards myself. So I recommend that you might check that out if you're interested in learning more about this topic. And this is just, you know, something I've written about before where I felt almost I had this Dorian Gray where the image on the surface looked fine, but underneath I had things eating away at me that were so negative and distorted when I would talk this way to myself or blame myself for things. And I was sort of prone to self uh, uh, just mm, judgment and toxic perfectionism. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, it still can be a tendency that many of us still have, but at least being aware of it and then noticing it and then taking some steps to deal with it can really help us, I think, move to the next level. And I, I feel that stoicism has helped me with this a lot, too, because it's helped me to realize a lot of these things really aren't in, in my control. Oh, you know, I applied for that job. I didn't get it. Oh, you know, instead of saying to myself, oh, my God, I must not have been good, I was not qualified or something happened, you know, instead of that, you, you can also look at the point of view of some things are out of our control and we just can't, it's not something we specifically did. The other thing is common humanity. Again, this theme of we are all human, we all make mistakes. If not, we would be boring robots and who would really want to talk to us? It would not really be the kind of world that we want to live in. So the fact that we make mistakes, the fact that we're imperfect, means that we are human and that we are able to also change. Um, this is very interesting to me. It, it, I find that there's a lot of these myths about self-compassion that make people not want to cultivate it. So some of the prime ones that you hear are, well, it'll make me self-centered and, and soft, and it will suck my motivation and drive if I really am too caring and supportive to myself and treat myself as a friend and it will I'll lower my standards I'll let things slide because I won't be hard on myself and I won't be pushing myself um I think a lot of people feel that and I even see that so much in our school system where it's just like you know driving driving our students and um you know they drive themselves I have two teen daughters and definitely see that a lot so we try to work on this in my family and uh, I think there's huge benefits to self-compassion. And these are things that um, Kristen Neff has pointed out that I think are very valuable to consider. Uh, when we feel compassion for our own difficulty, we're more, li more likely to actually address our problems in proactive ways, as opposed to just 
you know, kind of stew about them and feel sad about them and then not really do anything to make a difference or change. For example, you know, we don't do well on a test. We can actually go out and get extra tutoring and, and move forward as opposed to just saying, oh, I guess I'm, I'm horrible at this. I'll never be good at math. I'll, oh, I'm just an awful person. Really, it's, it's a way to say, okay, you know, dust yourself off and get back up. It's fine, just move forward. So when we understand that our, some failures are gonna be inevitable and some um, difficult times will just be inevitable, we can really forgive ourselves better and set new goals and then actually achieve more in the long run. So that goes against this thought that we'll lower our standards and not be able to achieve anything if we have self-compassion. I think that this is a much more healthy way to achieve things and to get things done that we want to do as opposed to a rather toxic way of this, you know, kind of pushing and, and, and driving ourselves through negative self-talk uh, and judgment. When we realize that humans are inherently imperfect, we can be kinder to ourselves and we can work on our shortcomings rather than judging or hiding them. And this is something, you know, I think about every day uh, because there are things I do. I say, oh, why did I, why did I forget to say that in that meeting? Oh God, why now she's not going to know that, you know? Uh, so, well, I'll say to the next meeting, you know, that, uh, most of these things are not really uh, that important. And the ones that are important, those also, you know, inevitably there will be adversity and things may not go how we want them to. And so we still have to forgive ourselves and we still have to be able to find that self-compassion and try to move forward. Uh, there's huge benefits to our relationships through um, having good self-compassion and working on our self-compassion because people who do this are more accepting of their partners. They're more willing to respect other people's opinions and their significant other's opinion, and they give their partners more freedom and more ability to make their own choices. Uh, those who don't have self-compassion are described in the studies that uh, Kristen Neff presents as being more controlling, critical, inflexible, and self-centered. Um, they have no tolerance for themselves, and therefore they have no tolerance for other people. I think that's part of what happens there. Uh, and Neff has written about this quite a bit, and I find it really interesting. Uh, so she says that building our own resilience gives us the resources to care for our loved ones and to place fewer demands on them and to really sustain our relationships in a much healthier way. And I think this is also very much related to stoic concepts of relationships as well. So I'll speak a little bit more about stoicism versus empathy. I'm sorry, stoic compassion versus empathy. I, I mentioned that earlier in the talk that um, empathy is something that uh, we usually think of as, oh, well, that's how we, we care for others. We have this empathy. Uh, but both stoicism and compassion cultivation, they, they acknowledge that only certain things are, are up to us and we really can't fix other people and their, their issues. So that's part of the reason why um, the lens of empathy and emotional identification with others' pain and suffering is problematic. Um, it, I mean, it, it's, it's great in theory, and I think it can be great. And there are various different definitions of empathy. So I'm just taking one definition here that's, I think, the most common definition to showcase some of the flaws and some of the reason why I think compassion as a concept and as, a, as an approach is actually better than the concept of purely empathy. Empathy in the sense of putting yourself in the shoes of the suffering person and feeling for them, like I feel your pain. The, the issues with it is that that kind of approach can lead to feeling emotionally drained. They call it empathy fatigue sometimes, especially uh, among medical professionals and even caregivers uh, as well. Um, and you get entangled in your emotions with that other person's emotions. And they may have very negative emotions like fear and anger and hurt. And, and, and it may be very hard to then be able to kind of be there in a substantive way because you're somehow caught in that, that um, chaos of very difficult difficult emotions. So then you end up maybe set, feeling a sense of, of powerlessness because you can't fix that or guilt because you really can't, you can't lift that other person out of this. You can be there for them, but you can't really change it for them. So sometimes this actually ultimately leads to withdrawal from the suffering person because you feel frustration, fatigue, and a sense of despair at not being able to change anything. Um, so I wanted to just share the stoic approach to compassion in the way it's different from that. I think they really 
try to avoid emotional over-identification with Epictetus in particular, here's this, this quote, um, which I, I'll read out uh, for us to, to think about this. Whenever you see someone in tears, distraught, be careful lest the impression move you to believe that their circumstances are truly bad. Have ready the reflection that they're not upset by what happened, but by their own view of the matter. Nevertheless, you should not disdain to sympathize with them, at least with comforting words, or even to the extent of sharing outwardly in their grief, but do not commiserate with your whole heart and soul. So to me, that means that it's still important to preserve your own inner flame of compassion, even while you are sympathizing with them. You are sympathizing, you are caring, you are offering comforting words, you are hugging that person, but you're you're not kind of becoming at one with that person's own suffering. That to me is kind of important concept, which I found really interesting and really helpful as I try to cultivate compassion, compassion in a wide variety of situations in my life. Um, I had this thought that, you know, there are folks here involved with stoic fellowships. Could we look into forming stoic compassion circles? Uh, I kind of try to do this in my, my own life with people that I know in um, my group of friends and family, but sort of forming a circle of people who can feel this way, but also discuss how we can apply both stoicism and compassion in difficult situations in our lives and uh, working on new ways to use that as part of our pro-social behavior, our common humanity. I just found that to be an interesting concept, so I wanted to throw that out there in case people are interested in maybe pursuing that. And now I hope we have time for these exercises. I think according to my clock, we're okay. Yes, you're good. Thank you, Brittany. So I have uh, a few that I'd like to share. And um, I know some of you are busy traveling in cars and such. So I don't know if you'll be able to really, really um, do this now or not. But I, I think we should try it and see um, if we could do a loving kindness meditation. So I, I will lead us through it. And we'll just take a few minutes to try this out. So you can settle yourself and your breathing. Sit, sit naturally. You may want to have back support if you can. And you may close your eyes or you can soften your gaze if you prefer. Um, steady your breathing, breathe in a couple times. And now repeat to yourself. And first I'll offer the phrases that are traditional. This is based in a Buddhist meditation that uh, we did learn in the compassion cultivation which I will start with those, which are, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, may I be free from suffering. We actually begin with ourselves in this loving kindness meditation, which is traditional in the Buddhist approach. Now, you may also want to consider using a stoic phrase or make up any phrase of your own for this. I would like to share a few stoic phrases that, that I've used that I really liked. So, may I live in agreement with nature. May I be wise and brave, just and temperate. May I know the value of my character. Now, as you say one of these phrases or a couple of these phrases to yourself, imagine breathing warmth into your heart and then breathing out warmth toward yourself, letting the sense of compassion permeate your body as you breathe. So we'll keep breathing just for a moment or two.
Next, we'll turn to direct these same phrases to someone close to us. It could be a family member. It, it could be a friend. It's someone you feel close to that you want to feel compassion for right now. So saying these phrases or the phrases that you've created or the Stoic phrases, um, in the tradition it is, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, may you be free from suffering. So we, let's try that now for a moment. Um, please say your phrases, addressing it to that person. I love this part of the meditation when we think of that person, because I feel that it helps us go a little deeper into what that person's challenges may be and think about addressing that compassionate flame directly towards those things in our mind, in our, in our feelings. And then next time we see this person, we have that, we have developed that resource for that person as we talk to him or her, as we share with him or her, as we ask them questions about their, their lives and their challenges. It's, it's like we have directly grown that within ourselves, I feel. And then finally, we can pick a person or a group that we don't know very well and that we might not feel anything in common with or we might not really feel that even that positive towards or we might just feel neutral. So um, it's about spreading this out in the circles of concern. So we can pick a, a group that may be far from our own friends and family, but that we, we want to feel this for, and we want to get outside our, even the smallest parts of our bubble to a wider sphere. So again, repeat the phrases that you've been using and direct them towards this person or this group. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be free from suffering. And with that, we will close this part of the meditation. And um, I'd love to hear later when we have the Q&A portion or in the chat, if people had experiences with this, they found it interesting. I find it super interesting to do this and, and super beneficial to my practice as, as the uh, person who wants to cultivate stoic compassion. Um, I have one other actual exercise for us to try. It's shorter. And it's the self-compassion moment. And this was something Kristen Neff had shared in her workshop. Um, I really like this and it's, it's pretty uh, brief, but I think it's, it's kind of moving. So it's about finding that self-compassion within you. You can notice if you're stressed or feeling discouraged about something. You put your hand or both your hands on your heart, or you can choose to put them on your belly, or you can clasp them together, or even hug yourself with your arms like this, and you take several deep breaths and you say something like, this is hard right now, but I will make it through. Um, or a stoic version that I like that I uh, came up with is, as long as I trust my ruling center, I will be okay. Or create any phrase that you like. Really in the workshop I took, we were encouraged to create any phrase. And I think you can apply a specific phrase to a specific type of stress or challenge that you have but it's actually a very interesting moment because you're physically mimicking some care and concern for yourself. 
which gets you out of maybe the more purely intellectual version, which maybe as Stoics, we're often in that mindset of it's, there's a purely intellectual version of how we think about things and care for others or ourselves. But I, I like this because it, it does help us connect a little bit more with our body. And I think that takes us out of some of those negative voices too. Um, so let's try this for a moment. So do choose how you'd like to uh, move your, your hands and your arms, and then um, think of a phrase that would work for you and just say it as we take a couple deep breaths. Thank you for doing that. And finally, I just have a couple more quick slides that are things you probably already know, but just wanted to mention. Journaling, we know this is a stoic tradition and um, we know that this is something that can help us and we should be doing it, but let's also think about how to do it in terms of compassion. For self-compassion, uh, you can write a journal entry as a letter to yourself as a friend. So what would a friend say about you right now? and what you're coping with and what you're handling and how you're doing. Uh, in terms of compassion for others, you could write down what you love about or what you're grateful for in other people. You can journal about those who are tough to feel compassion for and imagine their struggles and consider how you can grow a non-judgmental connection with them. So I, I encourage that so much. Um, and last, re reflection, just uh, reflection about what's in our power, what's not in our relationships with those who are suffering, brainstorming ways we could help or just be present for them. Maybe it's just bringing them a cup of coffee or tea, or maybe it's, you know, giving a phone call rather than just clicking a like on social media. What are the ways we can, how can we reflect on being there for the person uh, rather than not trying to fix them. We've already discussed that's not really going to work and not going to be very helpful, but we can be there and show that we're there. Uh, reflect on those you'd like to feel more compassion for. It might be people in your life you don't get along with. Consider what they've overcome and practice looking at others with compassion and a sense of common humanity. And we can use these reflections also to avoid emotional overload, overload because we want to keep growing that compassion. We want to cultivate it towards others and ourselves. And uh, with that, I will stop sharing my slides. So that, that's really the, the talk I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Meredith. That was beautiful. I know I felt a lot of compassion listening to Meredith. I hope all of you did too. Um, feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat right now. We've got about five minutes. We'll do five minutes for questions. If anyone has a question or maybe you'd like to share your experience during that compassionate moment, I think that would be really lovely to see. And I'd just like to start with one question, Meredith, while we're waiting for those questions in the chat. You shared a lot of really interesting and really nice practices with us. Do you have something in particular that you do as part of your daily routine that you feel really works for you or that you'd like to recommend? Which of those practices do you feel is the most helpful? So sorry, Brittany, I lost you just for a moment while you, you were asking me this question. <laughs> do you mind rephrasing it? No worries. Yeah, sure. Just wondering of the practices that you shared, which ones do you find the most helpful in your own practice? Which ones do you find yourself coming back to? Thank you for asking that. Um, that's definitely why I wanted to share those exercises, because I think those two exercises, this loving kindness meditation and, and meditation more generally and mindfulness meditation, I think those are really at the core of it. Um, it doesn't even have to be formal, like I am going to sit for 20 minutes now and meditate, but just taking that pause away from the normal everyday things that are stressing us out and that are making us feel, ah, um, you know, it's, it's kind of critical to rebuild the inner resources. Um, and I really do try to think about other people's 
struggles in terms of what are they experiencing? Um, because it's so easy, especially, you know, a lot of times in our culture, we just hear kind of us versus them. Um, or in our in our regu regular everyday life, something goes wrong and we there's so much of a tendency to blame that other person. Um, so I try to think about, well, what would it be from their perspective? And actually my children teach me this too. They're, they're really better at this than I am. And I'm so grateful for that. I have two teen daughters, as I mentioned, who are now 17 and and 14 and they they will they will stop me and tell me oh by the way you know you're you're blaming the auto mechanic for not getting back to you well maybe he had something wrong and then it turned out last night i found out he had stomach flu all week so you know <laughs> i was i was a little worried about where was my car and that's just an example of you know stop and think about what is what is the other person experiencing and then when it comes to myself this concept of the the self compassion moment i think is an amazing one and i think tailoring those kinds of phrases to yourself whether or not you feel some people may not feel comfortable doing the arms or the hands but just even to take that moment and realize wow this is difficult and then kind of view it from that bird's eye view which is also critical in stoicism right the view from above the view from above yourself helps you to see uh maybe a, a new self-compassion for all you're coping with and all you're juggling and maybe all you're actually doing pretty well Wonderful. Thank you. So in many ways, it does shade into mindfulness, which we will be talking about with Tim in just a moment. Absolutely. Um, and so one question here from Marcus is, how do you identify where the line is for emotional burnout? So Marcus, I guess um, you can clarify, but maybe this is how do you know when you start needing that, <laughs> needing that extra self-compassion? Or how do you prepare yourself so that you don't cross that line, maybe? Yeah, yeah. I think that that's really interesting. It is, again, about the awareness building, I think, inside of ourselves, because sometimes we're so quick to try to rush to uh, fix something or, oh, we can change that up and that will work better, rather than realizing, wow, this is actually really hard and I'm really feeling that that burnout. And sometimes it's just talking to a friend. Sometimes it's just um, taking that moment. I often will feel the kind of stress or tension like in my in my belly, like in my in my body. I'll feel some of that stress or tension and say, oh my gosh, I can see I'm getting really um distraught or really stressed right now. If the question is more about the empathy uh that causes burnout, that's one where I think if you feel you're starting to avoid the person or not want to be in the presence of the person because that person has been expressing suffering and you feel yourself over identifying i think that's a real um that's a key reminder that okay we need to switch from kind of feeling that person's pain to actually being there for that person as they suffer with our own internal flame yeah that's really crucial we had a comment earlier from i believe this is erica who said she was a nurse and she had to stop working due to that physical and emotional burnout. So this is definitely an issue. So thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Jacob in Kenya. I'm wondering if compassion is something we cultivate in ourselves over time, or is it something we're born with? It's a really good question. And I, I don't know the answer, but I do know we can cultivate it if we choose to. Um, I imagine there's some people who may not choose to do that. But I think that um, if we see that uh, we can have better relationships, we can all build this, we can all get better at this. And doing these practices over time will help us do that. Um, but that, that's a super interesting question. I'd love to turn that towards maybe some psychologists or some researchers to find out more about it. Yeah, awesome. So thank you everyone for those questions and for your attention to Meredith's talk. We are going to go now to Tim Iverson, who is going to tell us about um, stoicism and mindfulness. So Tim is a middle school art and humanities educator in Minnesota. Based on his own experience with mindfulness, he began incorporating mindfulness into his own teaching many years ago. He now facilitates mindfulness lessons and is a former board member with the Mindfulness in Education Network. Tim is also an organizer for the Minnesota Stoics, and he's the author of Advice for Every Hour and Calm and Curious. So thank you so much, Tim, for joining us. I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you, Brittany and uh, Meredith for that great presentation. It's always an important reminder to have compassion for ourselves. So um, I'll go ahead and, and share my screen. And uh, 
shout out to everybody who I would say to my group in Minnesota who took the time to uh, out of their day to, to join us. Oops, let me just escape here real quick. <clears throat> And um, uh, you can tell the Minnesota folks because they're in their down jackets and uh, wool caps. So, um, you know, I'm gonna just, let me, uh, let me let's see real quick here. You're gonna see a preview of my, my whole show here. Uh, let me try, yeah, let me try this, here we go, all right. Always some technical stuff. I'm very happy to be here today. And oh, what, what is the, oh, I know what I gotta do. There we go. Very happy to be with uh, all of you today. And uh, and uh, thanks to Brittany uh, at Stoicare, uh, Brittany Polat for, for putting this together and for her wonderful website. And uh, she she and uh, uh, Meredith and, and others like uh, them are carving the way for some new thoughts about uh, 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 stoicism and uh, compassion. Uh, you know, it, it has been said that uh, um, over 90% or more of ancient Stoic writings are lost to us. So people like uh, Meredith and Brittany are kind of reinventing uh, uh, Stoicism for the current age. So my hat's off to them and to uh, all the rest of the folks involved in this field. So today we're going to talk about mindfulness. And um, I was a middle school teacher for, uh, for uh, 20, 30 years, I, I guess more like 30. And uh, we did some talking in the classroom, but we had to do a lot of doing. And, and so um, practice is a big part of my approach to uh, all my uh, spiritual uh, work. So let's begin with um, uh, just a mindful moment. And uh, similar to what Meredith was sharing a, a few minutes ago, but um, I have a picture here of, of, a, of a, a citadel or a fortress. And, and if you're familiar with Marcus Aurelius, uh, he talks in his meditations in book four about the inner uh, retreat that we can take at any time. And he says, it doesn't have to be for long, but we, at any time we want, we can sort of pull ourselves away from the external world, even if we're in the midst of chaos, and we can recover ourselves. And so I think that's very inspiring. So let's do this. Um, if you'd like to turn off your camera, or uh, again, you can, you can leave it on, it doesn't matter. And just let yourself become very comfortable in your chair. And just a quick thought of gratitude that we are able to be together here in this moment with these amazing tools of technology and that our lives are in some kind of order that we, we have a couple hours in our day to reflect uh, and uh, talk some philosophy. But let's bring our attention inside and even away from me uh, away from your screen. We call those external things. And we're just going to move our attention inside for just a few moments. And you'll notice that you're going to feel yourself sitting in your, your chair, on your couch. And just do your best for just a moment or two to tune in to those inner sensations. The sensations in your legs and feet. Maybe in your chest arms and hands, your neck and face. And Meredith was talking about the importance of recognizing the body. And here we have this amazing, amazing uh, machine that was put together by nature or God, however you want to think about it. And uh, it's really important to give it a little attention in kind of a non-judgmental way. <clears throat> And let's bring our hands now, let's focus a little more to our, um, excuse me, bring our attention into our hands. Whatever position your hands are in, just notice how they are. Notice this, the sensations that are coming from the palms of your hands, your fingers, thumbs, maybe noticing the temperature of your hands. We call those impressions or just information that we are getting all the time that we may not be aware of. And just allowing our hands to be for just another moment and grateful for the hands and all the work that they do for us. And you can also pay a little bit of attention to what thoughts, what thoughts 
are going through your mind. And the Stoics called this our ruling faculty, which judgments or thoughts are flitting through your mind. Just take a notice. All right, and we can open our eyes and we can proceed. <clears throat> and thank you for that mindful moment. And however that worked out for you is okay. There was no special way to feel or be. All right, uh, a little bit about myself and what the heck I'm doing here and talking about this stuff for. Um, I was a classroom teacher for 30 years, uh, retired a couple of years ago. In the last 10 to 12 years, I became involved in the mindfulness and education movement. Uh, I, I uh, actually edited this book uh, uh, called Educating Mindfully. It's put out by COSM. And I introduced mindfulness after a lot of practice on my own, uh, especially sec the secular version of mindfulness called mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, I did a lot of study with that, as well as with Buddhist uh, meditation. Uh, but I, I started to share it in my classroom, of course, in secular ways. And I saw the power not only for myself, uh, in maintaining my tenuous sanity, but also in the, the classroom. And I eventually went on to share in my school, in my district. And then I served for four years on the Mindfulness and Education Network board, which is, uh, they were based on the East Coast. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my friend Richard Brady uh, is a teacher, couldn't join us today, but he put together some amazing conferences over the years. And he always called, uh, the subtitle of each, each one was Mindfulness as a Foundation for teaching and learning. And, and I love that because it reaches also into stoicism that mindfulness or simply being attentive is really a foundation for any activity where we're trying to improve ourselves, we're trying to educate ourselves, we're, we're on a spiritual path. If we are not attentive or focused at least to some degree, there's no way we're gonna make progress. Uh, so when I when I share with you today, I'm probably going to be a little more on the stoic side of mindfulness, but it, it's just all about attention. And, and I will say, I think some people are very naturally mindful and attentive, and some people may never go to a lecture on mindfulness. They will never practice meditation, and they may be just fine. But I think the vast majority of people could use a little mindfulness training, and some people need a lot of mindfulness training uh, in the very fundamental act of attention. All right, so I would like to um, actually start out with a little bit of mindfulness from, from the Buddhist um, um, tradition. And so Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, was a very famous Buddhist uh, monk and Zen teacher, mindfulness teacher who died just a, a year or two ago uh, after living into his 90s. And uh, from his book, Living Buddha, Living Christ, which is a classic, he shares this story. <clears throat> When the Buddha was asked, sir, what do you and your monks practice? He replied, we sit, we walk, and we eat. The questioner continued, but sir, everyone sits, walks, and eats. And the Buddha told him, when we sit, we know we are sitting. When we walk, we know we are walking. When we eat, we know we are eating. So what I love about this passage is that, number one, it's not talking about psychedelic visions or maybe religious experiences. It's talking about a very simple practice of awareness. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, in our stoic practice or mindfulness practice, we don't necessarily wear a uniform. We don't walk around with a bullhorn telling people that we're super spiritual. We just act a little differently. And hopefully that inner light shines like uh, Meredith was talking about. I love that inner flame. Hopefully that our inner, inner light will shine as we go about our daily uh, experience. But that's a little from the, the Buddhist tradition. All right, let's see if I can get my... Okay, and now from, from Epictetus, who was, a, uh, for those of you not familiar, he was one of the three famous Roman Stoics, lived in the first and second century AD. He wrote a, or, or his student wrote a famous book called The Discourses, where he recorded his thoughts. And uh, I love this passage from Epictetus. He says... Uh, well, let's say today I'd like to play. Well, what is to prevent you from doing so attentively? For is there any area of life to which our attention should not be extended? Will you do anything worse than by paying attention or better by not attending? So Epictetus, what I love about him is his directness and simplicity and even kind of upbraids his student sound again. He says, is there anything you should, you know, you should go through life and, and not pay attention to? 
And so, uh, you know, I, of course, I agree with this. And, and there's a time when we can be a little more relaxed with our attention. Uh, but, but I think uh, in most cases, being present is going to help everything that we do and keep us from causing a lot of harm. All right, so just a little bit, for, a little formal here. So uh, my definition of mindfulness is <clears throat> intentional awareness of our inner and outer world. Okay, and if you want to keep it real simple, it could be just a sort of intentionally observing, being aware. Uh, and then I, I like, there's the, the Pali, the ancient Indian word uh, from the Pali language is sati, which actually means remembering or recollecting. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, one facet of mindfulness is that we are remembering not only where we are, what we're doing, what we're supposed to be doing, what our duty is, what our values are, what our principles are. And that's a lot to remember. <laughs> but you know, when you're in those tough situations and you're about to tear someone's head off or you're about to pick up the phone and scream at somebody, it helps to remember what your principles, you know, whether you're a Stoic or you know, a Christian, whatever your, your, your practice is, to remember what your principles are. And a shout out to my friend Diana from Minnesota for her, her beautiful photograph here, for which she uh, recently took. So thank you, Diana. All right. Uh, another aspect of mindfulness, which was brought up by John, John Kabat-Zinn, who was kind of the founder, the, uh, he was a scientist and, and a founder of the secular mindfulness, or at least one of them. In his book, Full Catastrophe Living, he, he outlines seven attitudes of mindfulness. And the very first one he calls non-judging. <clears throat> and as Stoics, we talk a lot about judgments. Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, so uh, in, in mindfulness training, there's a lot of talk about approaching our experience and, and setting aside our judgments, just being with our experience without really commenting on it and, and, or judging it good or bad, right or wrong. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my throat's kind of dry today. Uh, so I love this quote from Marcus Aurelius because it's in the same vein when he says, when you are distressed by an external thing, it's not the thing itself that troubles you, but only your judgment of it. And you can wipe this out at a moment's notice. So what's beautiful, and, and if you only take away one phrase from my, my talk today, look this one up later and uh, maybe put it on your bathroom uh, mirror. Uh, so there's two approaches we can take in any situation. We can modify our judgment of it. We can change it to a more positive or maybe a more, a more neutral uh, uh, cognitive appraisal, or we can just have no, no opinion at all. We can just observe it and be present with it, okay? So non-judging, excuse me. All right. So a couple of the paradoxes of any spiritual path, but especially of mindfulness, is acceptance, uh, this is a couple of the pairs, acceptance and change, body and mind. And so in any moment, we are probably unconsciously deciding whether to accept a situation or whether to change it. And sometimes our attitude needs changing, sometimes a situation needs changing. At other times, we are just uh, uh, being with things as they are, like Meredith was talking about in her presentation. Also, body and mind, although we use the word mindfulness, it actually includes the body because the mind really includes um, all of the sensations that are coming from our body and from the external environment. They're all part of our nervous system. So um, mindfulness training really embraces a much uh, a larger approach of, uh, the, of the mind. <clears throat> All right, see if I can get this one here. Okay, so there's a lot of evidence from uh, about the benefits of mindfulness. I, I won't go into this uh, 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 in too much detail right now, but uh, you can see that, that reduction in stress, anxiety, and depression, uh, greater focus, re reduction in rumination, improvement in working memory, and increased cognitive flexibility. There are also physical benefits uh, that go with a, a, a consistent mindfulness practice, which you can look up certainly online. Um, it's also used in treatment programs like for smoking cessation, addiction, uh, pain reduction. So there's a lot of benefits to it. But we know as Stoics, we don't get too attached to the results. We just practice and uh, see what comes of our practice. <clears throat> All right. I, this is another uh, a great text from Epictetus when he says, um, 
from his Enchiridion, his short handbook, verse 38, he says, when walking in the woods, watch for sharp stones and fallen branches in your path. So too, when thinking, take care not to stumble into illogic and unreason. Uh, this is a translation by Sam Torriday, who, who uh, calls this the manual. But what I love about this, there's the very practical aspect of mindfulness, which is paying attention to what you're doing. You know, don't get hurt, uh, but also paying attention to your mind that you don't stumble into, uh, you know, uh, cognitive biases, cognitive distortions, jumping to conclusions, which we are uh, want to do very often. Um, I do watch the news and, and more politics than I should. And I often see politicians jumping to conclusions and and make you know and practicing some of these biases and uh, it's very distressing and unfortunately I, these things appear in myself also so it's a, I love this phrase here by Epictetus. All right, and in a very practical uh, note, uh, I, I I say I've never regretted paying attention, but I have regretted times when I have not paid attention. Uh, I was telling Brittany earlier, um, I, I spent a couple of weeks in Florida recently and I rode my, my e-bike all over Delray Beach and I was very careful, didn't hurt myself, but then I was unloading some groceries from my car and I tripped over a curb and went crashing onto the, 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 the cement because I was rushing and I wasn't paying attention. So there's a, this very practical uh, 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 part of mindfulness, which uh, is very important. All right, and another aspect of mindfulness is, is being in the present moment. So Marcus says in his meditations, forget the future. When and if it comes, you'll have the same resources to draw on, the same logos. Uh, logos. So the, the, the Stoics, were, you know, although they talk a lot about the future, there's certainly a time to plan and contemplate the future, but then we need to learn how to come back to the present moment, to what's right in front of us and let the future take care of itself. <clears throat> All right, from David Feiler's book, Breakfast with Seneca, he, he outlines, which is a fantastic book, I recommend it. Uh, we're reading it in our Minnesota group. Uh, the power of simple observation, and I think, Brittany, you touched on this in your great Stoicon uh, talk. Uh, one of the first and most effective ways to reduce worry is simply to monitor your inner judgments and the emotions they give rise to as the process happens and as you start to feel anxious about future events. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus called this practice prosoke, mindfulness, or attention. In other words, we don't always have to fix our thoughts or uh, change our beliefs. Sometimes just the simple monitoring of our thoughts or our inner, you know, our feelings and thoughts is enough to disentangle ourselves from them. Uh, Donald Robertson calls this uh, cognitive distancing. So if I have an impulse to, to run to Dairy Queen and get a triple Sunday, I can simply watch that impulse uh, and I can let it go, which we, we, we do naturally. Uh, or I can say, you know what, today I'm going to do that. I deserve it or whatever you're, you know, and you just, you go get the Sunday. But there's that, the power of monitoring our impressions and impulses is, is, is hugely important. It is practice time again, and um, I, I hope I'm not going too fast here. Uh, but I, I do want to share this very simple practice, which um, I, I shared and, and taught in my classroom for many years. And it's actually an acronym, S-T-O-P. And you can, if you, if you want to check this out later, you can find it online on YouTube very easily. And so um, I would invite you in the spirit of a beginner's mind to follow along with me. Uh, as I give some instruction, and uh, but you can certainly just uh, close your eyes and, and do your own uh, inner thinking or reflecting. I usually give that option to people because um, you know mindfulness really is 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 a voluntary practice. But uh, anyway, uh, let's walk through this, and 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 we'll take a breath and a little pause from our text. All right, the S in the stop practice stands for stop. <clears throat> So let's just let ourselves become still and stop what we're doing, whether you're writing, maybe jotting some notes about later your, uh, in your day. Let yourself become still, as still as you can, without being rigid. If you have any tension, you can release. <clears throat> 
The T in stop is for take a breath. Let's try one more, just a deep conscious breath. And the O is to observe. So we're gonna move our attention now from our breath to our body. And the spirit of this practice is non-judgmental awareness, which means we are just observing. We're not trying to stop anything. Ironically, we're not trying to stop any pain or sensations. The only thing we're stopping is the voluntary thinking or analysis. So we'll bring our attention down to our legs and feet, just observing. the sensations in your legs and feet. So we're sort of on the inside now. And we can use the stoic word impressions. I like to use the word information. There's actual information coming from our legs and feet. And we're moving up now to our chest and our stomach. Our shoulders. I often carry tension in my shoulders, so I'm going to let that go. Now noticing my arms and hands, my left arm, my right arm and hand. Moving up to the neck. the front of the neck, back of the neck, moving into the face, can you notice, can you feel the sensations around your eyes? And if your attention wanders away, you have the power to bring it back, just gently, just easily bring it back to your body, to your focal point, going up to the top of our head, the back of the head. How about the sensations in your ears? And now we're gonna expand that attention. This is another power we have. We can e expand our attention to include our whole body. Just getting a sense of our whole body sitting in the chair. Keep breathing. And expanding again, noticing what sounds are around you. And just a sense now of generally being present without a real specific focal point, just being present. The P is for proceed. So we can now proceed with the rest of our lesson. <clears throat> Thank you for doing that with me. And just notice how you're feeling. Again, there's not a right way to feel. We're just noticing what is there. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna continue. Uh, and this, this is a cartoon I created for my, my, a group, uh, a presentation I once made. And a couple stoic terms for you. The, uh, we, we've talked, both of us, uh, Meredith and I have talked about the ruling faculty, which the Stoics made a huge deal about. They really encouraged their students to cultivate and protect and take care of that ruling faculty, uh, which, um, couple synonyms on the right there, uh, choice, our sense of judgment or interpretation, that as we receive impressions throughout our day, uh, as, as we have experiences, we have the power in every moment to judge what that means for us. <clears throat> uh, the Greek terms are hegemonicon or the prohiresis, 
Uh, experts believe that the Stoics actually believe that uh, this, uh, these, uh, what was in our heart center, that this faculty, of course, now scientists have, have uh, located uh, these things in the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, the PFC, the executive center of the brain there, right behind the forehead. I used to tell my students to put their hand right up by their forehead. And right behind that, that skull bone there is their prefrontal cortex, where a lot of this activity happens. And if we injure that uh, cortex, then we, we're going to be in trouble. <clears throat> All right. And another a central question that Stoics ask themselves is, what's in our power? Uh, and, and, and we can divide this into internal or external things, right? Uh, we usually think about, well, you know, my, my neighbor's behavior is not in my power, but what about your own thoughts? What about your own feelings? How much are they really in your power? Okay. Uh, I would argue that our actions are mostly in our power, unless you've got a physical illness or disability, that your attitudes and intentional thoughts are in our power. But you'll notice when you start studying meditation that many of our thoughts and feelings are not totally in our power. And that's where the, the power of, of, of attention comes in, where we just allow those things to be. We accept them. Amor fati. We accept them for as, as they are. <clears throat> Some misconceptions about mindfulness and mindfulness practice, that it's about feeling bliss or nirvana. Uh, I would say some, some folks may encounter those states, but uh, I think that's largely uh, a misconception that uh, mostly mindfulness is about awareness. Uh, another misconception is that it's about stopping our thoughts. Uh, as I said earlier, it, it would be about refraining from consciously thinking, but not about stopping automatic thoughts. Uh, it's a misconception is that we are supposed to be mindful all the time. Uh, I would say that if you're a Buddha or maybe if you're a, a Epictetus, perhaps, uh, but uh, most of us are going to hopefully increase our mindfulness, but, but we're human beings and we won't be mindful all the time. And finally, that it's about the mind alone. Mindfulness includes the body in that total experience. All right, so mindfulness for Stoics. There's a little different uh, flavor for Stoics, perhaps. I see mindfulness as cultivating character, calm, and virtue. Mindfulness is for increasing self-awareness of our perceptions or our impressions. It's about avoiding harm or injury to ourself, to others, to our mental faculties. It's about living in agreement with nature. <clears throat> and uh, there's, there's a long discussion we can have about what this means, but for our purposes, it's about sort of being in harmony with the biology of our, of our life. We, our body has needs, our psychology has needs, we have interpersonal needs, and we need to rationally fulfill those needs without harming ourselves or others. Okay, Meredith talked briefly about formal and informal mindfulness. For a lot of us who are Stoics, it's going to be just informal mindfulness, trying to be more present throughout our day. Some of you may go on, go on to study more formal mindfulness. <clears throat> okay. I am going to uh, lead us through one more practice, and this one is actually a mindful eating practice. And of course, we're, we're not going to have you run to the fridge and, and grab something out of your, your fridge. Uh, when I was studying mindfulness, we often uh, took silent meals, complete meals in silence, which was a very wonderful experience. Or we did just a shorter version, and I, I did this with my students, where we took a raisin. <clears throat> Uh, where we just uh, uh, mindfully ate one raisin. And I, I wrote about this in, in my book, uh, Advice for Every Hour. Um, I was amazing how much suffering was caused by uh, passing out one raisin to uh, eighth grade students and, and having them eat raisins. Um, and so the variety of responses that I got was, was kind of humorous. Anyway, uh, let's try this one. And the reason I'm sharing this too is because mindfulness isn't just about breathing or sitting still. It's about bringing a, a awareness into our everyday life. And some people have included mindfulness as part of a you know weight management program. Or you know my daughter you know struggled with with uh, food for many years as a young person. Food can be a, a and even someone like me who never struggled with food suddenly the last few years I'm, I'm having to be more mindful about what I'm eating and how much I'm eating. Uh, so mindfulness of eating can be a huge uh, uh, practice for us. So if you'd like to, one more time, just get let yourself get comfortable 
And this is going to be a little more imaginative, but I'm going to encourage you later to try this out, maybe with dinner tonight, or if you're just sitting alone later, just having a snack. The goal here is to take one or maybe a couple bites fully mindfully with full awareness. Uh, I sometimes like the word savoring. So let's just say you're, if you can, to the best of your ability, you're sitting at your kitchen table, maybe you're at your favorite coffee shop. Go ahead and just select a piece of food that you're comfortable with and just visualize that maybe sitting in front of you on a napkin or on a plate. Uh, maybe it's sweet, maybe it's not. It, it's, it's totally up to you. And then let yourself take a deep breath and exhale. And your fork is down and then maybe you pick it up or if you're just using your hands, bring that item up to your mouth and just take one bite of that thing and see if you can feel it in your mouth and, and slow down your chewing and see if you can notice the, the sensations, you know, your, your mouth starts to producing, you know, liquids and, and saliva and just chew slowly in your imagination. And your mouth's going to want to begin to swallow. So let yourself go ahead and swallow. <clears throat> and just let yourself pause for a moment. <clears throat> and let's go for one more. Let's try one more. Let's say you've got a, whatever, a brownie or you've got a salad in front of you. See if you can pick up that fork for one more time. <clears throat> And just begin chewing. Noticing the tastes, the sensations. Begin swallowing. Okay. <clears throat> So I, I apologize that 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 was that was an imaginary exercise, but if you it, it's it's not real complicated. It's a matter of just slowing down, and and I would encourage you to try that later. And uh, I remember when my kids were very young, and uh, our the tendency at our dinner table was to um, uh, begin squabbling right right away. You know, maybe arguing about you know who's doing what to who, and so I began this practice of actually setting a timer. And I would eat silently for a minute or two. Uh, and I had two reasons, well, a couple of reasons for doing it. One was to model for my kids that one could pay attention to their food and to not get pulled into uh, fights because pretty soon you'd have, you know, three, four people squabbling if, you, if you're not careful. So that was a, it was a real uh, chance for me to practice mindful eating. And I even carried this over into my lunch meetings at school because even the adults uh, would come into the room and uh, the, the tendency is to you know, got, you know, start maybe uh, complaining about uh, what Jimmy did last hour and then pretty soon the, the room's in an uproar. So by just taking a minute to practice a couple of mindful bites, it, it kind of set the tone for myself and I avoided getting caught up in a lot of uh, uh, tough conversations. So mindful eating, thank you. All right, so as we begin wrapping up, we're around in the corner today. Um, this is a little more of just a reflection for you. You can jot down a couple things that come to mind. Where can we be more attentive and intentional? All of us have different lives. We have, we're at different places in our life. Some have kids, some don't. But things like, you know, is there, uh, uh, is there a relationship that you need to be just a little more careful, a little more present for, a little more mindful? Um, is there a danger situation that you work in or around that you need to be more mindful? Uh, maybe in meetings. I know when I went to many meetings in my, my teaching job, I had to be very attentive uh, to what was happening around me and what was being said <laughs> before, because the tendency, again, is to jump in and start judging something right away. Uh, maybe driving. Uh, you know, we just had a person drive into a, a store down the street here, and uh, I'm not sure of the circumstances, but uh, driving for everybody is a situation that can cause immense harm. 
Uh, so maybe that's maybe that's your mindful practice for one week is just to uh, you know to really pay attention to your driving uh, back and forth to where you're going. But uh, just take a second here and um, uh, just that, you know where do you need to increase your mindfulness just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. All right, and just uh, finally, uh, the beauty of this whole deal of having a ruling faculty is that we can always just choose to be present. We can notice where our mind is at. We can come back to the present moment. <clears throat> and we can also decide when not to be present if something is not worth our attention. Or maybe we only give this situation five seconds of our attention. So that's a power that we have, uh, our mind, our ruling faculty. We can always be present. <clears throat> All right. Resources for mindfulness, just real, just a couple here. Uh, Mindfulness-based stress reduction is now taught online as well as in person around the country. Eight week, usually eight week courses, highly recommend. <clears throat> and Mindful Schools is an online community. They also offer retreats. Uh, I've taken several of their courses, highly recommend. I think my friend Jen is on the line. She is a uh, certified Mindfulness Schools teacher. And any books by John Kabat-Zinn are, are wonderful. Wherever you go, there you are is maybe my favorite. John Kabat-Zinn, just a super pioneer. Um, apps like Calm and Insight Timer are um, just wonderful. I use those a lot. So, okay. And then I'm um, wrapping up. And this is my uh, contact information. I, I am a facilitator for the Minnesota Stoics. So shout out to all the Minnesota Stoics out there today. And uh, you can reach me through that app on Meetup or my email is at the bottom there. My recent book is called Calm and Curious. It's self-published and it's coming out this month. So um, that's on Amazon or artmobile.com. So that is all I have. I hope I'm ending at the okay time there, Brittany. Thank you. Yes, you're great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. And once again, everyone, if you have any questions or comments, please enter them in the chat. That was such a lovely presentation. Um, I just wanted to follow up with a question for you first, Tim. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about intentionality and attention with both of these practices, compassion and mindfulness. And I also wanted to link it back to one of your quotes from Marcus Aurelius about simplicity. I found in my own stoic practice, and as I try to become more mindful, that in a lot of ways, it's about kind of weeding out the things that don't matter and I think Marcus is constantly reminding himself to become more simple. He says it in several places. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that means to you about becoming more simple and if that relates to mindfulness at all. It absolutely does. And, be, you know, a mindfulness practice, let's say, you know, one of the first practices I learned, Brittany, was to sit down and like count my breath and you immediately learn to disregard everything around you or, and you just focus on us. It's, it's almost boring to the point of, you know, uh, silliness, but you learn to simplify your focus. And uh, especially in this day and age of, uh, of a million apps and websites, I mean, there's just so many, we're all overwhelmed with emails and messages that a, a mindfulness or a stoic practice can hopefully help us focus on what is essential and mindfulness is just like a laboratory to actually practice that. Uh, some of you may know my friend Stoic Dan, who's he, he has proposed that um, uh, we, we adopt a fifth virtue as Stoics uh, called focus. And he's making it one of his life missions to make that happen. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also just wanted to offer something from my own practice that I found really helpful. And this is from the book, Secular Meditation by Rick Heller. Mm. I'm sure you're familiar with it, Tim. Maybe some of our other um, audience members are as well. It's 32 Practices for Cultivating Inner Peace, Compassion, and Joy. And I actually learned about this from Steve Carafit, who many of you may know did the Sunday Stoic podcast for a long time. But one of the practices that really has helped me is the, I've forgotten the exact title, but it's an, a meditation on sound, a sound meditation. And I find it particularly helpful because I live in a very noisy place. I don't know if any of you have heard the background noise while I'm speaking, but I live on a street corner. So there are always trucks going by, loud trucks, motorcycles, dogs barking, all kinds of things, not to mention the three children inside my house. 
Yep. So I've, I've struggled with just accepting the amount of noise in my life. And this meditation asks you to sit and actually just listen to the sounds around you to observe it non-judgmentally, just like Tim's exercises were mentioning, but you're focusing instead of on your internal body, you're focusing on your environment and the sounds. And what it's done for me is helped me to appreciate the sounds in a way that I never did before. When I actually sit and listen and identify, okay, that was a bird chirping. Now here's another bird. This is this car. I've actually learned to identify the different cars that are going by, you know, trucks kind of overlapping. If there's a lot of traffic, there can be many at the same time. And to me, it's like a symphony. So yes. I've been able to go from just, ah, there's so much noise here. It's bothering me. I hate it to actually identify and kind of appreciating the, in a strange way, beauty of the sounds. Like it, it's kind of like a symphony of sound. So that's another practice that I would just like to offer as well to people. And there's all kinds of things. So Tim has awesome things in his book, awesome practices, as well as, as you saw today, some great theory as well. Oh, Lauren's saying, please repeat the book name. Um, so sorry, I'm just going to my Amazon page so I can read the title. Secular Meditation, yes. 32 Practices for Cultivating Inner Peace, Compassion, and Joy by Rick Heller. Um, and I'm sure both Tim and Meredith have multiple suggestions for you as well. But anyway, so mindfulness can do a lot of things for you. And this is really what we've done here today is really just the tip of the iceberg, right? Yes. You know, I was going to say, uh, uh, Brittany, that, you know, that sound practice is, is so great, but, you know, and when I was working with students, they often uh, responded more to those external sources of, of meditation versus like the internal ones, because they were, you know, kind of jumpy. And, mm -hmm. and so focusing on color, picking out a color in the environment, focusing on sounds or a bell, they loved that. And it was more external oriented. So um, that can be very useful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, wonderful. So again, if you have any questions, anyone, or comments, please enter them in the chat. Also for Meredith as well, or if you want to just have an overall comment on the workshop today or about stoicism in general, we have a couple of minutes for a discussion. Um, and just to put in another shout out for Tim's book. So this book is um, also available on the Stoicare website. Is yes. this the correct one, Tim? Yes, yes. So, so what we did was, uh, thank you for reminding me, um, Brittany and I put out a, a, a PDF version of this uh, a few months ago, and it is available on the Stoic Care website. I think it was called This Fleeting Moment. So what I did was, I, and she, uh, Brittany did a wonderful job of formatting and editing that. Uh, and then I took that content and then added a few things and, and, and added some of my artwork to this book called Calm and Curious. So it's, a, you know, if you want something to hold in your hands, um, it, that would be a good option for you. Right. And we do have a book giveaway with Calm and Curious. So I have entered everyone's names in a wheel of names like Wheel of Fortune. And I have landed on one name and it is Darlene. So Darlene, if you would be interested in receiving a physical copy of Tim's book, Calm and Curious, please send me a direct message um, just, just to me, not to everyone. Let me know that you're interested and we'll try to get your address and send it over to you. And I'd also like to thank everyone again for being here at our very first Stoic Care Workshop. This has been awesome. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We had two amazing speakers. Thank you again so much to Meredith and to Tim for being here and sharing your insight and wisdom with all of us today. And once again, if you are interested in learning more about Stoicare and being updated about our events, you can sign up for our newsletter. I know many of, it, many of you have already signed up, but please do um, register yourself, subscribe if you'd like to receive more news and information about Stoicare. I forgot to mention earlier, we will be having a new course probably in February of next year on Stoic love. I'm working on that course right now prepared for February, the month of love. And so that's going to be all about the foundation of love in stoicism and how we can love ourselves as well as other people. And it's going to incorporate many of these ideas from today and many of the themes that a lot of us find so important in stoicism. So it's not quite ready for signups yet, but if you're interested in stoic love, please do subscribe to our newsletter and I'll be announcing it through that as soon as it's available. 
So thank you again, everyone, for being here. So much appreciate your time. I did fix the link also for supporting Stoic here. So if you'd like to make a donation, that is available as well. And please let me know if you have ideas for future topics. Please get in touch through the Stoic Care contact form. We love hearing from all of you, your ideas, your questions, comments, anything. So once again, thank you, everyone. And I'm going to say goodbye. I wish you all very well. Thank you. Bye-bye.